We are in uh, Mark chapter 12. We're at the end of the chapter. And the title I have in my Bible is The Widow's Offering. The neat thing about preaching through the gospel is that I don't choose the topic. It's chosen for me as I preach through the gospel. And so I just want you to know this morning that that's the topic that we fell on teaching. So it says, And he sat opposite the treasury, Jesus did, and he watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. We live in a society where people do not like to be told what they're to do with the money they make. It's their money. They're, they don't want to be told where to put it. Um, they don't want to be told the things that they purchased with it, what they should do, or they don't want to be told the things they should purchase with it. And I understand all of that. And there is all kinds of causes in this world that we can give to. We can give to a number of different cancer organizations. We can give to ALS. We can give to the United Way. We can give to kids in Africa or other nations that are suffering. Haitian relief. We can give to so many different things. And people do give to those things. And it's a good thing. I mean, those are good causes. We need to be looking after people and, and caring for people that are suffering. And, and it's all good. But the motives or the reasons behind that giving can vary very much. <laughs> Some people might give because they have. You look at a Hollywood star and they, they get all the publicity about they went over to Africa and they sponsored this kid and this kid in Africa and they give this much to the relief fund. You and I don't get our, paper, our names in the paper when we do things like that. And so some people do it for recognition. Some people do it because it's a conscience appeaser. Some people do it because maybe they had a relative suffer in that um, situation. They had cancer or they had ALS or they had some disease. I don't know what all the reasons are, but people have their reasons for giving. In religion, it kind of goes the same. And in religion, it's kind of the same thing that don't be telling me what I should be doing with my money. And, and so we have this thing, and, and people don't like to teach on this because of that. But we have giving or tithing. Some people call it tithing. Some people follow the Old Testament tithing system. Some people follow the New Testament free will offering giving system. Personally, I believe we're under the New Covenant. We're not under the Old Covenant. I believe that God wants us to give from a free will. But we give to help the church. We might give to God. But then again, we might give because we have something to gain from it. Or we might give because we want people to know that we're giving. Or we might give for whatever reasons. And I don't know. But we might not give to the church too for reasons. Because of somebody might abuse those funds. Somebody might do something with them that they're not supposed to do. Or they're not going to do what I want them to do with it. And so I'm going to try to clarify some of this this morning in our lesson from the widow's might. And I called it the mighty might. Because that might that she put in, Jesus said was much mightier than all the other money that was put in by the rich people. You see, God cares enough about us and about His nature and His desire for us to be like Him to teach us about giving. Because the ultimate giving, of course, 
was God giving His Son that you and I can even have a relationship with His with Him, or to, and, and we wouldn't even be here this morning if it wasn't for that. And so that's the ultimate giving. But He cares enough to teach us about giving. And you know, some people are not taught. They don't know. They don't. There, it, it's not a natural thing for us to give of ourselves. Because the natural human tendency is more to take, to look after me. And so it's not a natural thing, and so we need to be taught. And some people aren't taught. And even if some people are taught, they don't understand. They don't understand the benefit in giving. And you will not understand that benefit until you give from your heart. And we're going to get into all of that. But there are benefits to giving that are not physical. And, but people don't understand. And they may have been taught the wrong idea. You have to give 10% or you have to give 15% or you have to do this and you have to do that. And, and so they hear all of these things and they say, I'm not going to be told what to do. You're not going to tell me what I give. And so, I just give up on it, and I don't give. I mean, I'm confused. What is right? What is wrong? And, and, and so, why should I give? And all of those questions come up. And then, God tells us that there's another human nature, natural thing that we do. And that is, we tend to give from the bottom, instead of the top. You know, the gravy is on the top. And we tend to give from the bottom. You see, what I mean by that is we tend to give from our leftovers. We've been studying through the, the Old Testament and the sacrificial system on Sunday mornings in our Bible class. And the one thing that God consistently said, it was the first fruits. It was a, an animal without blemish. And, and our tendency is to take the lesser and give it to the greater and keep the greater for ourselves, which is the lesser. That's human nature. But he says, I don't want it that way, and we're going to see that. If you look at the example of Cain and Abel, God liked Abel's sacrifice better. And we're not told the details of the sacrifices. We're not told why he liked Abel's better than Cain. But God is not a respecter of persons. And so something had to go on there that wasn't quite right with Cain or wasn't as right with Cain as it was with Abel. And maybe it was the heart behind it. Maybe it was he gave from the bottom instead of the top. We don't know. But something went on there. And so God says, you know, our tendency is to give from the bottom. But I want you to change that. And then he says, but in human nature, there's also that aspect of just outright refusing to give. And that comes from greed. That comes from selfishness. That comes from everything is about me and what I have is mine and I'm going to try and make it so what you have is mine too. And, and that's kind of the nature that we live by as humans sometimes. Now we want to change that. We don't want to live that way. But what we'll do is we'll justify it and we'll say, well, it's not all that important. And I need the money for this and for that and for this other thing. And, and I earned it, so it's mine to choose how I spend it. And we'll justify all sorts of things. But I know one thing for sure. That in this room, probably there isn't one of us that is suffering. That is suffering from lack of food. That is suffering from lack of things. In fact... We probably kind of fit into where the world's at sometimes, where we keep buying, and where we're supposed to put our car is filled with everything else, so we can't put our car in the garage because we're storing up and purchasing more. And that's kind of how our society goes. And so God cares enough for you and I that he says, look, these are the human tendencies. 
And I want you to understand that, but I want you to change it. And then the next thing he cares about and teaches us about is the human motive behind it. You see, I have been, I've talked to a lot of people, and most people it is, what can I get in return? Because that's how we function in society. If you go out and you're going to spend your money on something, you're going to make sure that you get a return that makes you satisfied with the money you spend. If, it, if that return isn't satisfactory, then you're not going to spend the money. And that's the system we live in. And we try to cut every corner we can, get things as cheap as possible, spend as little money as possible to get the most. And that's just how we live. And, and so, when it comes to giving back to God, a lot of people think, hmm, what am I going to get in return for this? Well, I know God promises us, because in Malachi 3 and verse 10, He says, make sure you take and put all your tithes in my house. Give it all to my house. Everything that you're supposed to tithe to your God. Because you see, they hadn't been doing that. And they'd been robbing God of tithes and things. And so, he said, make sure you put all that you are to give to me into my house. And see if I don't open up the skies. Basically, and this is my para version of it. Open up the skies and give you more than you can ever handle. And people look at that passage and they say, hmm. I'm going to write me a big check this Sunday because I, I'm going to see what I get back from this. And, and people will write those checks and it's kind of a health and wealth gospel that's, that's being preached. And, and they say, oh, you're not going to believe this. I wrote that check this Sunday and I got this humongous refund from the government in my mail that week. What they don't tell you is they had filled out their income tax and they were expecting that check in the first place to be coming. But they think that way and they want to do that. And so they, they, they attribute, I mean, I had a brother that prayed for a TV because they wanted a new TV and he went out and bought a new TV and he said, God bless me with this new TV. And I'm looking at him and I'm sure he thought, I thought he had horns growing out of his head because... <laughs> I mean, how ridiculous. But that's how people are. And so that's one of the things they do. The other reason they'll give is, what will people think of me? You know, there's a funny thing that happens as the trays pass sometimes in the church. Have you ever had that feeling, I wonder if someone's watching what I put in here? And you think about that and you go, oh man, maybe I should put a little more of that. Five bucks isn't enough, maybe, or, or something. And, you know, we all go through it. And I'm putting this out there because I know that all of us go through it. We just don't always talk about it. But the truth is, sometimes we wonder about what other people are thinking of us or about us. And, you know, Jesus was sitting watching this woman, this widow, put her might in. He was watching too, wasn't he? So there is somebody else watching. I guarantee you, and it's God. And it really doesn't matter what I think or what David thinks or Brock or Norm or anybody else. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. And we're going to see this in a minute. It really only matters what God thinks. But people will do that. The Pharisees were accused of this by Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 3. They're standing on the street corners and they're showing off with their prayers and they're tooting their own horn. And Jesus says, you know, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. In other words, he's saying, don't go out there and give to the poor. And before you give to the poor, get the media to come in with all their cameras and everything and all the people over and say, now look how great I am. Here you go, poor fella. He's saying, don't do it that way. Just give. And no one has to know, but God knows. And that's what's important. And then we give from our leftovers. We give because we have it. You know, um, well, I got extra money this week, so I can give to the church a little bit this week. Because I got extra money. Or... Um, 
well, yeah, we came into a, a, a bunch of money, and so, yeah, maybe we could give a little bit to the church. Um, if you look at the widow's might, God is saying, it's not of your abundance that I want. Because it's really, and we're going to get down to this, it's really not about the money. It's not about the money. It's not about doing things necessarily. There's another thing behind all of this that really matters and really counts. And God cares enough to teach us the pure or godly way of giving. And he says it starts with the attitude that you have. It's all about attitude. It's all about the heart. I want to read a passage to you in 2 Corinthians and in chapter 8. Paul had written to the churches, and of course the churches were giving to help the other churches that were suffering in the first century. And in chapter 8 he says, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, now hear that, in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Now listen to that. I mean, you've got to hear what he's saying there. He says, out of their affliction, out of their extreme poverty, it doesn't sound like these guys had a whole lot to give. And he said, out of all of that has overflowed a wealth of generosity. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify. In other words, Paul's saying, I know they aren't in a position to give a whole lot. But they are giving a whole lot anyways. And I testify of that. He says, and beyond their means, of their own accord. Oh, you mean they chose to do that? They weren't under compulsion to do that? They just chose to do that. Begging us, oh no, listen to that. They're begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. They were begging Paul to let them. When Paul was saying, no, you guys need to look after yourselves too. Take care of yourselves as well. So don't be careful. Don't do, don't, don't make yourself even worse poverty. And they're saying, no, Paul, please let us help with this. In their poverty, they were begging to help. And this, not as we expected. Human beings, that makes no sense. We don't expect that. But they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Oh. They gave themselves first to the Lord. I think there's the key to this whole thing. Because if you don't have a heart for God, chances are you won't give. You have to have a heart for God to give. Because only then do you understand the benefit of giving, the participating of giving, the fellowship of giving. Only if you're with God. So, what we say, what we do, who we are, is a matter of our attitude and our heart. That's what God is saying. In Matthew chapter 6, and starting in uh, verse 19, of course that's the Sermon on the Mount. But in chapter 6, and starting in verse uh, 19, he says... Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, listen, there your heart also will be. Hmm. Jesus says, teaches us, it starts with the heart, with the attitude. And if we get that attitude right, then we will give willingly and not out of compulsion. 
You know, if I give because I have to give, I've given nothing. I got to tell you that God doesn't need your money. Yeah, we need money for the to pay for the building and the heating and the, and the ministers and we need money to to spread the gospel. But God doesn't need your money. He needs your heart. And he knows that if he's got your heart, then he's got all of you. He's got your money. He's got your possessions. He's got all of you because he is everything to us when he's got our heart. And that's the thing. And so when, when God has us and, and we have God completely, the willingness isn't even a challenge. It's a natural thing. It becomes a natural thing. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and starting in verse 6, Paul says, The point is this, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And the first thing I think when I see that and I read that is, Man, the more I give, the more I'm going to get. That is not what God wants us to do. He's saying, and, and, I, and I'll, get, I'll wrap it up with this, but bountifully doesn't have to be money. There are many better things than money that we need bountifully. I'm thinking the grace of God, His mercy. I'm thinking salvation. I don't think you can even put a price tag on those things. But he says, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever says bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. And this is what they did in the first century church. They didn't tithe. They gave as each one decided in their heart. Not reluctantly. Not, oh man, I have to give this to God now. He didn't give under compulsion. Well, God said, I have to, so I guess here it is. That's not what he's talking about. He says, God loves a cheerful giver. A giver that says, man, I can't wait to give this and see the work of the Lord get done. I can't wait to give of myself here to help that person out and to give myself here to help that situation out and give of myself there to help that situation out. I just can't wait to do that. I have a desire to do that. You see, it's all about desire. It's all about wanting to be part of God and part of God's work. And when we understand that, it is no longer a burden, but it becomes a pleasure. It becomes something that we want to do. And that's what the widow displayed. But it's one other thing, too. With the widow and her might, Jesus was saying, when you give so it hurts, when you give so it costs you, then you understand giving. You see, we've been looking, like I said, in the Old Testament, and the, the worshiper that took the sacrifices to the altar to sacrifice them to God, it cost them. It cost them because it was their priciest Lamb, it was their priciest bull, it was their whatever animal, it was their most precious one that went to the sacrifice. It cost them huge. And Jesus is saying, give a little so it hurts. Because then it is all about your reliance upon God. Until then, you're giving enough that you're keeping enough back that well, in case things go bad, i still got enough for the rainy day. Right? And our society is all about teaching us that. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have a savings account. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have RRSPs. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have all those things. I'm just saying, in the widow and her might, Jesus said, that's giving. Because she gave her all and trusted in God and relied upon God. She didn't give out of her abundance. And so the text actually says that she put in everything she had. 
How many people here, and I don't want to see a show of hands, but how many people would do that right now? Just completely trust in God, give everything you had. I'm not saying that we have to. I'm saying it is about trusting in God, our giving. That's what it is. There's an old man who loved books. He collected books. And he had an acquaintance he ran into. And this acquaintance had taken an old Bible out of his attic and had just discarded it, thrown it away. And he was telling him about that he had just thrown this old Bible away. And he said, you threw an old Bible away? He said, you know, and, and I'm not sure whether the guy was a Christian or not, but he said, it could have been worth a lot of money. He says, oh, not this one. He said, it was written by Guten somebody. And he, that, that guy's jaw just dropped. He said, by Gutensburg? He's the one that wrote that Bible. He said, do you know there's some on the market last week that went, that sold for over $2 million? And the guy that threw the Bible away he says, oh, well, this one went to fetch you a dollar. He said, someone by the name of Martin Luther had scribbled all over it. <laughs> what I'm saying is, value is in the eye of the beholder. Okay? Value is in the eye of the beholder. How important is God in your life? How important is the salvation that He's given you in Christ Jesus to you? How valuable is that? Because I think sometimes, you know, we do like with our giving, we have the what should be first last, and what should be last we put first. And we have a terrible habit of doing that as human beings. Um, we, a lot of people try to fit God into their schedule instead of God being the Lord of their schedule. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we just fit God into our lives where we think He would fit okay and benefit us. But we don't put him on the throne of our life and say, God, rule, and I'm listening to you. And when we do that, God's not that important. And I hate to say it, but it reflects in our giving, not just financially, but in our giving in every aspect of the body of the church. Whether it's helping someone, doing something for the church somewhere, giving, whatever it is, it affects that when we don't have God on the throne of our life. It was reported that 11 millionaires went down on the Titanic. Major A.H. Pushen left $300,000 in his cabin in money, jewelry, and, and, sec in, and security boxes and all of those things. He left it all back there. And when they asked him why, I guess he survived because they could ask him why. He said the money seemed like a mockery at the time. So I just grabbed a half a dozen oranges because he's going on a trip and he didn't want scurvy. That's basically what he's saying. And the money wouldn't have bought him out of that. What price do you put on fellowship with God? You see, he's given us salvation and he's given us fellowship. To some, that fellowship is of great value and they will leave everything of the world behind for that fellowship. And others think they can hang on to all the things of this world and still maybe eke in that fellowship some and be okay. And so we have to ask ourselves a question at the end of the day. What is God worth to me? What value do I put on God being my God? What value do I put on salvation? What value do I put on fellowship? What value do I put on living in peace because of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ? And those things will determine how we give to the church. I don't know where you're at this morning. I know that's a little bit of a hard lesson. Um, but that's the truth. And... If you're with God, 
and you need it, you're having a challenge with that, seek out encouragement, get some help. We're here to help you. If you're not in Christ, then you need to do that first. You need to get there first and then get this on right and have a great and wonderful, blessed relationship with God. If we can help you, won't you come when we stand and sing? Speak unto me holy, speak off with thy Lord. Abide in him always, and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children. Take time to be home.